Everybody, I'm in Orlando, Florida, Cache Line, USA, having a good time with my family. Uh, Sandra is in the picture. She's actually taking the video right now, and that's why she's not in this picture. But we had a great week enjoying mid 70s temperatures while you're suffering in sub zero temperatures over there in Connecticut. Right now, as you're watching this, we are on our route back to Connecticut. I am so pleased to have with us this morning at Cornerstone Church, Pastor Nick Uva, who's an assistant pastor at Harvest Time Church in Greenwich, Connecticut. It is a growing, dynamic church and a real friend of Cornerstone Church. I'm so pleased to have him here, be able to share with you this morning. Would you please give Cornerstone, would you please give Pastor Nick Uva a warm Cornerstone welcome. Thanks so much, Nick, for being here this morning. We appreciate you. And Cornerstone, we'll see you when we get back. God bless you. Bye. Love Say you. Bye-bye. Good morning, everybody. God bless you. It's great to be here. Great to, great to be in my part of the world. They usually keep me down in Greenwich, but I'm really from around here. I'm not really from the part of Connecticut that thinks it's New York, okay? I actually grew up in Watertown, so it's always great to be uh, in this part of the world, and uh, just thank you for that uh, introduction, and uh, just appreciate so much Pastor Eric asking me to come and share the word of the Lord. It's always an honor to be asked to uh, preach in somebody else's pulpit, and just want to thank everybody uh, for taking such good care of me this morning. You guys have a great uh, worship team. Uh, the worship is great, and it's just, it's always good. You know, you can get the spiritual temperature in any church really quickly. When you hear the people behind you uh, worshiping and the praising the Lord, then you know you're in a good place. Amen. And um, well, uh, I'm the associate pastor at Harvest Time Church uh, in Greenwich. And if you don't know what an associate pastor is, you can think of me, I, I guess I'm, that would make me the Joe Biden uh, of the church. And uh, if, that, if that helps you figure it out, but uh, my wife and I have uh, three kids. Uh, we've got uh, three kids that are all uh, in their early 20s. And uh, do we have uh, any veterans here or any uh, military moms and dads uh, in the room? So, yeah, God bless you folks. Uh, our son uh, is in the Army. He's done two tours uh, in Afghanistan already. And uh, just want to remind, I always like to remind people, please pray uh, for everybody that's, uh, that's deployed. Um, you know, the, the wars uh, have kind of wound down a little bit. And we do need to remember that there's still folks that are over there that are still uh, in harm's way. And uh, lots of things can happen, you know, and uh, we just uh, we just pray the Lord's blessing on everybody that's deployed. So uh, I work mostly in the area of prayer and uh, adult discipleship. And so I was really excited to see on your website that you have a motto here that says that you're building people in Christ and you're building up, and I think that's great. I think that's powerful. Um, be committed to growth. Be committed to growing people. Be committed for the long haul. You know, in church, we love when there are these radical transformations that happen in people like that, you know, and you can see when, when God really uh, zaps somebody, you know, it's awesome to see. But I think most of the growth in churches and in people takes place, you know, over the long haul. It's the, it's the main and the plane of growth. It's just being steady, being committed to the Lord. So I want to encourage you, get into the growth track that you have here. Uh, it sounds like you're doing that right after service, and there's even free lunch, too. So how can you go wrong? That's awesome. And uh, we're also in the middle of a building program. We're adding a new sanctuary, just like you folks have. So I want to congratulate you on uh, what you've done uh, to grow. Uh, you have great uh, pastor and leadership team here, and I want to congratulate you on what you're doing to keep growing. Uh, I, I watched uh, the pastor's video and uh, on the website, and we've had the same experience where people would come uh, to the church, and they would kind of leave in frustration because they would pull in the parking lot, and they would circle a couple times like vultures waiting for that spot, you know? You know when you go to the supermarket, and you're kind of pointing and mouthing the person like, are you going? Are you leaving? And they're like, no, I'm not leaving. I'm just getting here. So so we've had people leave the service and not be able to attend. And I guess you folks have been there as well. So um, we'll pray for you and you pray for us. Right now, we've got a big hole in the ground uh, that we're afraid every day somebody's going to fall into. And uh, a new sanctuary is going to go in there. So we'll pray for each other. And the kingdom of God is going to grow in our state. Amen. If you have your Bibles or your phone or something, uh, I want to invite you to come over with me to Ephesians chapter 3. I think we'll have the words on the screen, but Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading at verse 14. Ephesians 3 and 14, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. 
so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend, to grasp with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Powerful prayer from the Apostle Paul. Paul was a man of prayer, and I want to share with you this morning a little bit about how you and I can be more effective in our prayer lives as well. I, w I had no idea until yesterday that, that Pastor Eric has been taking uh, you folks through a series on prayer, and I want to share with you on this topic, praying big picture prayers, praying big picture prayers. Why don't we pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister as we look into the word of the Lord together today. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' beautiful name. It's the name that opens heaven's door. And Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word. It's a lamp for our feet, and it's a light for our pathway. Jesus, you said that the word of God is like seed. And so we open our hearts to you right now. We ask that our hearts might be good soil, soil that can receive and retain and bear fruit from the word of God. Jesus said the words that he speaks to us are spirit, and they are life. So Holy Spirit, come and minister life to us from the scriptures now. If your heart agrees with that prayer, just say amen and amen. Well, you know, having the right perspective is important. And a lot of times we misinterpret things, we misinterpret situations because we think we've got the whole picture and we really don't. Sometimes we only really have one small piece of the puzzle. There's an old story, maybe you've heard it, of a man who became terrified at the idea of flying for the first time. And as the departure date grew near, he became increasingly nervous as he thought about what it might be like to be five miles up in the air. Finally, the terrible day came, and the man found himself breaking out in a cold sweat as he looked out the window of an airplane for the first time. And in his excitement, he shouted and said, look at those cars down there. They're so small. They look like ants. And the flight attendant said, well, they actually are because we haven't taken off yet. <laughs> now, that's an old joke, I know, but we've all been like that man at one time or another. We get used to seeing things with an earthly perspective. We don't necessarily know what things look like from above. And having a limited perspective affects our thinking in a lot of ways, and it certainly will affect our praying as well. The prayer that we just read is one of a number of similar prayers that's scattered around the New Testament, and we call them apostolic prayers, apostolic prayers. And as you can imagine, the reason we call them that is because most of them were composed by the apostles. And they give us a wonderful insight, they give us a great window into the heart and into the thinking of that first generation of, of shepherds, of leaders in the body of Christ. Paul and the other apostles prayed beautiful prayers for God to make us fruitful and for the Lord to bring us to maturity. Reading those anointed prayers makes me wonder how awesome would it be if we really learned what it meant to pray the scriptures, to pray the scriptures. I know some of us already do that. We already pray the scriptures. I'm sure that you read the Psalms, and I'm sure that you probably pray other Bible prayers as a part of your prayer life. Obviously, Christians from the beginning have always used the Lord's Prayer as a pattern for our praying. And uh, if you've been around church for a little while, you'll remember a few years back that a lot of Christians were reading and studying about the prayer of Jabez. But when I talk about learning how to pray the scriptures, I'm talking about something a little bit deeper. I'm talking about digging into the word of God and finding the jewels of his promises that he has scattered there for us to find. I'm talking about praying God's promises back to him in faith. It's the kind of praying that says, God, you said in your word that you would do this. We sang about that, actually, at the beginning uh, of the service. Lord, remember your, your promise. Remember your, your goodness. Remember your promise to us, Lord. 
And we've got a lot of wonderful examples in the scripture of people who prayed that way in faith, who reminded God of what he said he would do. People like Daniel and people like King David. Praying the word of God is powerful. But praying apostolic prayers will help us to pray prayers that are great in every way. The apostolic prayers I like to think of as the big picture prayers of God. I believe that the apostolic prayers are the most profound, the most strategic way to pray God's word. Praying these prayers transforms our character. And it helps us to pray with a heavenly perspective, unlike our friend in the airplane that hadn't taken off. We don't want to pray from ground level, but we want to pray with the view from 50,000 feet. Praying this way means that we are beginning to see and we are beginning to pray from God's altitude because these prayers are God's big picture prayers. And I want to share with you three important reasons why we need to pray God's big picture prayers. Three reasons to pray these big picture prayers. And the first one is that praying God's big picture prayers will bring us into God's purposes. They will bring us into the purposes of God. There was an old hymn um, that we used to sing 100 years ago when I grew up, and uh, it was called Standing on the Promises of God. Anybody remember that one? So praying apostolic prayers is more than standing on the promises of God, as important as that is. It's about letting God shape our entire thinking and our entire prayer life. Praying apostolic prayers is about more than just praying for my needs and the needs of others, as important as that is. It's about learning to pray for what God says people need. And it's about learning to pray for what God says I need. God wants, us to, God wants to teach us how to pray for the things that we did not even know we needed. Praying apostolic prayers will help you to do that. It will help us to get a better perspective on our lives and pray about the things in life that are the most important. You know, as a New Testament people... It's essential for us to use these prayers so that we can pray in a New Testament way. We do need the Psalms and we do need the prayers uh, that are contained in the Old Testament. But I believe that we especially need the prayers that the Holy Spirit wrote for the church to pray. Because those are the prayers for you and me, for our growth and for our fruitfulness. Those prayers were composed by the Holy Spirit, especially for Christians. And as we go through a couple of these, you're going to see what I'm talking about. You know, church, I need to pray for what I am facing. I need to pray for my health. I need to pray for the material needs of my family. But sometimes I need to go out into waters that are a little bit deeper and I need to pray that God will help me to grow up. I need to pray some prayers that will help me change into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Prayers that talk about the ultimate goal of my faith. Prayers that talk about what God would like me to be like 10 years from today. You know, it's natural for us to think and even worry at times about where our kids and our grandkids are going to be at uh, spiritually and otherwise, 10 years from now. But did you know that God, because God still thinks of us, of course, as his children, no matter how old we are, God is still concerned about where you are going to be 10 years from now. What are you going to be like in 10 years? God wants to teach us how to pray about that. And learning to pray those apostolic prayers will help us to pray that way and pray in harmony with God's big picture goals for each one of us. Now, that may sound deep, and it actually is a little bit deep, but it's not as daunting, it's not as challenging as it may sound. In fact, it's very easy to get started. And I want to recommend to you one of the best Bible studies that you can ever do for yourself is to go on what I'd like to call a little treasure hunt. Go through the letters of the New Testament and spot within them the prayers that are contained there and begin to pray those things. When you see those prayers for faith and prayers for growth, your personal growth in the text, make a note of them. I like to highlight them. I like to underline them, even memorize them. But write them down. Get those prayers of the word of God down deep into your spirit. 
understand what they say, understand their flow. Some of them are pretty deep. Now, this prayer we read to, uh, to begin this morning is a deep prayer, but the Holy Spirit will help you. He wants to help you understand these prayers that are a little deep because he wrote them for you. There's a wonderful prayer in Ephesians 1 where Paul prays that we might be filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Could anybody stand to have a little bit more wisdom in their life? We don't always know what to do. There's a powerful prayer in Colossians 1 where Paul prays that we might be filled with the knowledge of his will. How many of you want to know and do the will of God? I've never met a Christian yet said, you know, Pastor, I'm not frankly really interested in God's will I've never met that person yet everybody that I meet wants to know God's will it's another great prayer in first Thessalonians 5 where Paul asks God to set us apart completely for him so that our lives would be blameless until the day of Jesus Christ what a thing to think about what a thing to pray God has put that into the word of God for you because he wants you to realize that that is his big picture purpose for your life and we need to pray those things for ourselves. Not just praying as important as it is for the needs that I have this month, the, the checkbook, and all of those things. Passages like that made up the prayer book of the early church. I'm glad that we have books of prayers for different occasions that you can get a hold of. I'm glad that there are devotionals and all those things. But I'm just old-fashioned enough to think that the best prayer book is the one that God gave us. Now, we need to pray these prayers for ourselves and for our children. We should pray them for our church. We should pray them for other Christians that we know. One of the things that you can do, and it's a great exercise, is to actually write them out on, on a piece of paper. I'm, I'm all for the electronics. I've, I've, got, you know, I've got gadgets up to my eyeballs. I'm, I'm right there with you. But there's something about the way that God wired your brain to work that you learn more, I believe, and it's more reinforced in your mind when you write it out. So um, one, of those, one of the best things you can do is write those prayers out in a piece of paper or put it inside your Bible and insert your name on it or put the name of your your kids and your grandkids into those prayers. I'm sharing something with you that's very easy. Yet it's very powerful when we do it. We can pray those prayers for ourselves, put yourself into those prayers, and you will rise up in your faith and you will experience the intention of what God has there for you. So you can pray. You can say, God, I pray that Ephesians 1, I pray that you would give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Let the eyes of my understanding be opened so that I may know what is the hope of your calling, so that I may know what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints, so that I may experience the surpassing greatness of your power towards me as a believer. You see how that works? It's powerful. You can pray those prayers for your kids. Put the name of your son in there and say, God, I pray for my son that he might be filled with the knowledge of your will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, that he might walk worthy of you and completely please you in all respects. Isn't that awesome? And when we're praying these prayers, what are we doing? We're praying with God's purposes, his big picture purposes for our lives and minds. We are praying God's perfect will for our lives. We are praying now, when you're praying that way, we are praying about what God thinks is important. You know, God is very kind to help us in our ignorance. No offense. It's not, not customary to go to another church and tell, you know, say, you know, visiting preachers do that. Turn to your neighbor and say, you know, you're ignorant. We try to avoid that. But God is very kind to help us in our ignorance. The Bible says we don't know what to pray for as we ought to. But the Spirit helps us. He comes alongside of us, and he makes inter intercession for us. That's certainly true when we pray in tongues. That's what the Bible says. When we pray in other tongues, the Holy Spirit gives us unknown words that will enable us to pray the perfect will of God. Because as the Holy Spirit gives me words to pray, I know that the Holy Spirit is not confused about what I should be praying. He knows what is the will of God. And if God has enabled you to pray in an unknown tongue, you ought to do that every day. 
Paul said, I thank my God, I speak with tongues more than you all. And he didn't say that because he was from the South. He said that because he prayed that way more than all of them. And I'm, gl I'm, God that, I'm glad that God lets us pray that way because then we can pray beyond our limited human understanding. I pray in tongues because I don't always know what to pray for myself or others. And we don't always know what is the best way to pray about a situation in our lives. Another thing that comes into play is that I may have my own opinions about what you need. Isn't that interesting? When we're praying for other people, what are we really praying? Are we always really praying about what they need? Or are we praying about what we think they should be doing, what we think they need? Our prayers can be colored, can be a little tainted by our opinions about other people. But see, if I humble myself and if I admit that I don't always know the best way to pray, then God will give me his grace and he will let me pray some perfect prayers, some prayers that are in accordance with his perfect will when I pray in other tongues. And a similar thing happens, a similar thing to that takes place when we pray the apostolic prayers of the word of God. You may not know what you're saying when you pray in other tongues, but when we pray apostolic prayers, when we're praying these big picture prayers of the word of God, not only do you know what you're saying, but you can pray for people with faith. You can pray for people with confidence because you can know that you are praying the perfect will of God for yourself and for other people. You might say, well, yeah, but praying in tongues, that's something supernatural. Well, so is this. Consider this with me, church. We know that all Scripture is inspired by God. Amen? The Bible says that the Scriptures have been breathed out by God. The Bible tells us God's will in the very exact words, the precise words that God wanted to express. So when we are praying these prayers of the Word of God for people, we are praying for exactly what God wants us to know. We're praying for exactly what God wants us to possess in our lives and experience. So God, in your praying, wants to give you an, an unfair advantage. He's put it right into the Word and said, this is something important in your life, part of my big picture purposes that you need to be praying about. Now, that may not seem as supernatural as praying in tongues and, and all that, but it can be just as life-changing to pray with my understanding for the exact things that God wants me to have and experience. People always ask their pastors to help them find God's will. Well, I have good news for the church today. I know God's will for your life. God's will is for you to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. God's will is for you to experience his great power. God's will is for you to be filled with the fruits of righteousness so that God receives praise and receives glory when he looks at your life. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, we know that because in the word of God, in his big picture prayers, those are just a few of the things that God says he wants you to enjoy, he wants you to experience. And as we pray these prayers, we'll start to understand the will of God for ourselves and others. Praying this way lets me pray some prayers that are higher than the prayers that I've been praying up until now. It lets me pray for my friends and pray for my family in a way that goes beyond the limitations of my knowledge about their lives and their situations. It lets me pray prayers that are wiser than the prayers that I've been praying. It lets me pray for things that I didn't even know were important things that I didn't even know were a priority in the mind of God as to how we can grow. When we pray like that, we can unlock the perfect will of God for our lives that we see in his word, and we can connect ourselves to his purposes. So that's the first important reason why we want to pray these big picture prayers, his apostolic prayers, because they bring us into the purposes of God. The second reason is this. Big picture prayers don't just change things. They change us. Another reason we pray these prayers is because they don't just change things, they change you and me. As we pray these prayers, we begin to be changed. And as the Bible says, he will take us from glory to glory. We go from one level of glory, from one level of reflecting and showing who Jesus is to the next. 
As we pray this way, we start to understand what God thinks is important for our growth and maturity. Now, it's important to seek out godly wisdom. It's important to have mentoring and study church leadership and conflict resolution and all of those things. All of those things are wonderful, and we should do them. But I think it's only when we focus on what God says that we need that we start to get unstuck. I got stuck a few days ago on my way to a funeral in the snow. I got stuck in a snowbank. And the really embarrassing thing was that it was in my own driveway. So I, I had to expend a lot of effort to make sure that my daughter did not find out about that because I'll probably spend the next five years of my life living that down. But you know what happens is sometimes we're not quite paying attention in life or in a snowy driveway about where we're going and we get stuck in a snowbank. Do you know anybody that maybe is a little stuck? You're moving on a little bit in your walk with the Lord, and you know here's somebody that seems to be stuck in the same place, not growing maybe. Uh, wives and husbands, please don't look at each other. Um, you know, But we're not necessarily growing because we've become stuck, and we need to dig ourselves out. And praying these kinds of prayers will help us to get unstuck. You know, friends, I think that the apostles were less concerned about changing things in our life than they were about making sure that we got connected to life. Their great passion was that we might grow up in all things into Christ. How would you like to be more like Jesus in every way possible? Could you use a little more grace or a little more wisdom? Could anybody use a little more love in their heart today? Have you maybe ever felt a need for a little more patience? Anybody ever prayed the mother's prayer? You've heard of the Our Father, but the mother's prayer goes like this. Lord, give me patience, and I want it now. That's the mom's prayer. But we could use a little more patience, amen? We need to grow up into him in all things. Well, these prayers will focus us on the main thing, knowing God's will pleasing God, experiencing God's power. If we had to boil it all down to one thing, it's about Christian maturity. It's about becoming more like Jesus and reflecting who he is to the people that we encounter. We need to pray in accordance with God's heart. And his heart is that I grow up to be just like him, that I copy the pattern for all God's saints, which is to look like Jesus. Paul talked about his purpose. He said, I want to teach every man in all wisdom so that I might present to God every man mature in Christ Jesus. That was his purpose. Peter said, I want to remind you all of what to do so that in that way you will have a warm welcome in the presence of God when you see him. John said that he wanted us to break the cycle of sin in our lives and realize that the one who is in us is far greater than the one who is in the world and that whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And when we start praying about those things, as well as what I'm facing this month, when we start praying about those things, we get connected to God's intention, which is that we, the person next to you, all the people we care about will grow up. Paul talked about the goal of his ministry and ministry in general in Ephesians 4. He said that the, the job of apostles and pastors and teachers is about building up the body of Christ, he said in Ephesians 4, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And if you haven't reached the height of the fullness of Christ in your life, then you still have a ways to go. You know, if we think we've arrived, that's a good sign that we are actually deceived, amen? Because there still is a long way to go to look like and reflect Jesus. Paul says, I'm working so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. Maybe you have some Christian friends who seem to get tossed around by every wave of doctrine, every new thing that comes into the church of Jesus Christ every six months, every new bandwagon, they're on it. And Paul says we've got to get past those things, but instead, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up into all things, 
into him who's the head, Jesus Christ. That's a clear expression of God's will, that we grow up into Jesus. So, of course, yes, let's pray about our circumstances. We need to do that. And I know your pastor has been teaching you uh, about that through the month of January. We need to do those things. But, you know, God can also do so much more in me when I start to pray about who I am, about what kind of person I am. You know, many times as pastors, we hear people's real desires for their life. When we talk to people in our offices, you know, people don't come to our offices as pastors and say, Pastor, with tears in their eyes, Pastor, I need to have better things in my life. Usually people will say what they need is to be better people. That's usually what moves somebody's heart. Praying these prayers will help us to get there. It will help you and your family advance to new levels in maturity in Jesus. If you're stalled, this can pull you loose. If you're stuck, it can get you going again. Why? Is it because praying, as I'm talking about this morning, is some kind of magic ritual? No. It's because these prayers tell us what it is that we need to do to get off the Christian roller coaster and really grow up. Praying apostolic prayers gets us praying for the things that we need to do, that God knows we need to do if we're ever going to escape spiritual childhood and start to look more like Jesus. Why do we need to pray God's big picture prayers? First, because they bring me into God's purposes. And second, because they don't just change things, they change me. Finally, this, we need to pray God's big picture prayers because they connect us to God's ability to do more than we can even imagine. They connect us to God's ability to do more than we can even imagine. Started out by reading this prayer in Ephesians 3, and I want to read it again because I, I want you to hear the references to God's love and power. Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And then he gives this great doxology, this great blessing. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The third reason we want to pray these apostolic prayers, God's big picture prayers, is that they will connect you to God's ability that Paul spoke about here to do more than you can even imagine he can do. In the Old Testament, one time one, uh, God was chastising the people, and one of the things that they were being chastised for was he said that they had limited the Holy One of Israel. Can you imagine that God takes notice of that? That in our thinking and in our praying and our action, they limited God, and that was displeasing to God. But Paul says that God is able to do more for you and through you than you can even imagine. What was Paul praying for the believers to enjoy in this prayer? A couple of things I want to share with you really fast. First, he prayed that we might receive power through the Holy Spirit in the inner man. Nowadays, the outer man gets plenty of attention, right? But the inner man uh, needs a better diet. Now, you ate last Sunday the game. I hope your team won, but... Um, Last Sunday, you ate two pounds of nachos, right? But you can't eat like that every day. But in the spirit, a lot of times we continually feed our inner man junk food. And Paul is praying that we might receive power through the spirit in the inner man. We need to ask God again for power in the inner man, power over temptation and power to stand in all the trials of life. Spiritual stamina is not just about let's grin and bear it. It's not just about let's live one day at a time. It's about going to God and receiving his power. It's about saying, God, would you strengthen me with might in my inner man today? Second thing Paul prays there is that Christ would dwell, he says, in our hearts through faith. That means in the Greek that Jesus, what it means is Jesus becomes a permanent resident in your heart. I love that, that he has come to settle down 
in us. What a blessing that is, especially for anxious Christians to know that Jesus is abiding within our hearts as a permanent resident. We know some folks, and maybe you do too, they're not sure every day from one day to the next where they stand with God. But here Paul's saying we need to trust in God's word when he says that Christ is with us and truly within us. And we can draw upon the encouragement of his presence when we hold on to him by faith and determine that we're going to make him a permanent resident in our hearts. Then Paul prays that we would be rooted and grounded in love. This is pretty deep. This is the heart of the matter. And this is God's prescription for our lives. Our lives have to be rooted and grounded in love. And Paul is teaching us here that we need to pray that they will be rooted and grounded in love. What a simple thing to pray, but how much it might change us if we really did it. Rooted in love means that love is anchoring our hearts. Knowing that God is love will keep me anchored, keep me holding on in the storms of life. Being grounded in love in the Greek, that means that love is your foundation. In other words, when you build on the love of God, you will be solid and strong. But I think many of us are not rooted in that. We're rooted in something else. We're rooted in fear, maybe. We're rooted in jealousy or greed. And if that's you, then God is inviting you instead to become rooted and grounded in his love. Paul goes on, and then he prays for us to have strength to comprehend the dimensions of the love of God. That's so deep, uh, it's, it's almost going to give me a headache. Paul wants us to grasp the dimensions of the love of God. He says, to know the length and the depth and the breadth and the height of it. I think there's a picture of the cross of Christ in that image. One preacher said it like this, that God's love is wide enough to include every person. It's long enough to last throughout all eternity. It goes deep enough to reach the lowest sinner, and it goes high enough to take us to heaven. That's the four dimensions of God's love that's there, and they make that cross. If you don't know that love today, then I want to encourage you to ask God to help you to grasp his love for you. This is an area I'm sure you know where a lot of people get stuck. And Paul says that God's love is so great, is so deep. The dimensions of God's love for you are so unfathomable that we actually need some supernatural help just to understand it. Grasping that love will change you. How many of you know that a lot of the devil's plan for your life involves making sure that you don't believe God loves you? And we know a lot of people that have been stuck right there. Isn't that true? But God says, why don't you ask me to open your eyes according to this prayer so that you can see, so that you can really understand how much I love you. Pray that for somebody else so that they can get free in their mind and break out of that cycle of torment where they've convinced themselves that God doesn't love them or God doesn't love them anymore. God is finished with them and God can't use them and all these things that people get stuck with. Church, when you see the love of God, it will transform you. Then he prays as he comes to the end. He prays that we would grasp the love of God in unity. Paul says that God saved us to be part of a people, not just to enjoy our own salvation. Because he says, I'm praying that you're going to grasp God's love together with all the saints. So church, as you're praying for yourself, make sure that you're praying for your friends. Pray for for people you know who need to get hit by the love of God and be transformed by it. Paul's point, of course, is that this is not just about us. It's about caring for each other and making sure that we all grasp the love of the Father together. Then Paul prays that we might truly experience God's love. Praying for us to grasp his love is great, but Paul wants us to pray that we experience it as well. He says, I pray that you will know that you will experience the love of Christ, which is greater than knowledge. It goes beyond mere head knowledge of God. How can you know something that is beyond knowing? We find the answer when we look at the word that Paul uses there when he says, knowing the love of Christ. It doesn't mean know like I know facts. It means to know the way that I would know a person. And in fact, that word is used in the Greek when they would talk about knowing a friend or knowing a lover. And God says, I not only want you to know about my love, but I want you to experience my love. And again, this is something that God is encouraging us here to pray for. God, would you let me experience your love? How simple and how powerful, and yet it is a prayer that God delights to answer. 
Church, don't be satisfied just to study God's love, but make sure that you actually are someone who possesses God's love. And don't be satisfied until that is your experience. We need to pray like Paul talked about in Romans, that the love of God would be poured out of our hearts. And you can pray for that as well. Finally, the last thing, Paul prays that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Filled with all the fullness of God. Everything that Paul prays in this great prayer is immeasurably better than what I could ever think of in my mind to pray for myself. Do you see where I'm going with that? That's kind of the, the whole point of why we need to pray this way. Because everything that Paul has said there is so much greater than what I could ever come up with or what I might think to ask for myself or for my kids. You know, listen, you know, prayer can be just as simple as looking up at the sky and saying, help, you know. Lord, could you, could you work with me here? I'm trying to do your work, right? That's fine, but we need the prayers that give us insight into what God says we need and what God wants to give us that blows our mind. And when we look at this, when we look at a prayer like this, we hardly know what to do with it because it's so amazing. Paul doesn't say, I pray that you will be filled with God, although I think that would still be amazing. He doesn't even say, I pray that you would be filled with the fullness of God, which again, doesn't even seem possible. Instead, he prays something that is completely crazy, frankly. He says, I pray that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. And you know what, friends? If that were not in the Bible, I wouldn't even think it was possible. I would think it was some crazy heresy or something, you know? I pray that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. I can't even understand what all of that might mean to be filled with all the fullness of God. But it seems from everything that Paul has said as he worked his way through that prayer that that is something that will happen within us as we begin to grasp, as God gives us power to understand his love, and then as we experience his love, we become filled to all the fullness of God. Why is that? Because God is love. What would it look like in your life and in your family's life, if just for a day, if you experienced all the fullness of God and all the fullness of God's love was flowing out of your life, I'd love to find out, wouldn't you? What a big picture prayer that is, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. I think that's about the biggest thing that we could imagine ever praying for because there isn't anything bigger in the universe or beyond than that. Paul says at the beginning of Ephesians 3, we didn't read it, but you can blow your mind and read it later uh, at lunch, that it was always God's intention for us to enjoy that together with all the saints, with all the people of God that have ever lived. And Paul prayed that we would experience all those beautiful things. And then he showed us how to pray for those outrageously big things, things that have no chance of happening at all unless there really is a living God who wants to do some amazing and impossible things in your life. How many of you would agree with me this morning that the need of our nation is great? How many of you know that the needs of our families are great? Our need for provision is great in churches all over as we try to grow the kingdom of God, working together with the Lord locally and in missions work. Our need for provision is great, but God is able. So let's pray bigger prayers than we've been praying until now. Let's pray to God about our daily lives, but let's also start praying about God's purposes and about God's high calling in our lives. Let's look in the word of God, find these prayers, and let's pray them and start thinking, go to God again about where God wants you to be in 10 years. I don't mean God's going to send you to a foreign land. I mean, who are you going to be in 10 years? What kind of person are you going to be in 10 years? You can start praying about that, and you can start shaping that person today through praying at a little higher altitude than just praying about what's in your checkbook this month and all of those things. And 
don't misunderstand me because those things are so important and God gets himself glory. God gives us beautiful testimonies by how he shows up in the simplicity of the day to day. And yes, I believe God will give you a parking space if you pray, especially if you get there early. But um, let's not only pray about our kids' problems, but let's reach into the future with prayers from the word of God and let's shape our kids' future with prayer. I'm going to give you homework. I'm not, I'm not your pastor, but I'm going to give you homework today. I want you to go on what I call a treasure hunt. I want you to go on a treasure hunt. I want you to go through your Bible this week. Go digging through the letters and go on a treasure hunt and find these apostolic prayers. Find some apostolic prayers and start praying them for yourself. Usually you can find them at the beginning of of some of the letters of of Paul and Peter and the others, when they are greeting the church, they usually tell the church how they're praying for them, and you can find them there. Sometimes you find them at the end when they are finishing off one of the letters. They are blessing God and praising God, and sometimes you'll find that language in there. But it's a great treasure hunt to do, to find those prayers. Find those apostolic prayers and put your name into them. Pray God. Begin to pray God's perfect will for your life. See, I just ruined your life because you have no, no longer have any excuse to say, I don't know what the will of God is. You can look into these letters and find out where God wants you to go, how God would like to shape your life so that in 2025, you look so much more like Jesus than you ever thought you could be. Let's pray that God will not only change things, but that he's going to change us. Don't give up on yourself today. I think somebody needs to hear what the Bible says, that he who began a good work in you is going to continue to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So you're going to make it because of Jesus' work in your life. And finally, let's ask God to blow our minds with his plan and his love. And let's realize that he really is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even ever imagine through his power that's within us. Let's pray the big picture prayers of God and let's see the power of the God of the impossible released into the life of each one of us and the life of your church. Amen. Let's stand together, and I want to ask you to give Jesus a great hand of praise to come on. Come on, let's, let's applaud the Lord. Let's give thanks to him. I want to ask you if you'll, just for a moment, just before we close, time is up, but I want to ask if you would lift your face to heaven and lift your hands, and I want you to be in a posture just to receive, just to receive from the Lord. And I'm going to pray one of these prayers over you. I'm going to pray the Ephesians 1 prayer over you. It's a powerful prayer for connection to God and His purposes and His power. And Paul ends that prayer by talking about exactly how amazing the power of God is. What exactly is the power that God wants you to experience? So let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the people of Cornerstone, Lord. I thank you for Pastor Eric. I thank you for the leadership. Thank you for each one who serves, Lord, teaching children, taking care of the building, Lord, everything that they do, Lord. And I thank you for each person, for each life, each family that's represented here. Father, I pray that you would give to each and every one the spirit of wisdom. And I pray that you would give to each one the spirit of revelation, in the knowledge of you, a spirit that can quickly and easily grasp revelation from heaven. Lord, I pray that the eyes of their understanding would be opened right now, that they may know what is the hope of your calling. God, that they would be able to lay a hold of your calling in their life, that they would know what are the riches of the glory of your inheritance in the saints. And Father, that they would know that they would experience the surpassing, the incredible greatness of your power towards them as believers. Father, because your word says that the power that you want us to experience like that is like the working of the mighty power that you exerted in Christ Jesus when you raised him from the dead and when you set him at your right hand in the heavenlies, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. See, we're always worried about the devil. We're always praying defensively about what the devil is doing. What you pray in the word of God is so much more powerful than anything the devil does. 
Father, I pray that that power that you exerted in Christ when you seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places would flow out of your people, Lord God. That they would experience that power, Lord God. Lord, that your church would have faith to know that you have given Jesus to be the head over all things to them. And Father, I pray, Lord, that for each one of us, Lord, you would give us the power to grasp together with every believer what is the length and the breadth and the depth and the height to know that each one here would know, understand, and experience the love of Christ, which is greater than knowledge. And Lord, that as each one here understands your love, they will be filled to all the fullness of God. We thank you, God. We thank you ahead of time by faith that you're going to do it, Lord God. You're going to connect us to your purposes. God, we pray that you change us, Lord. That we would be 10 years from today, Lord. We would be the people that you want us to be because we have prayed and we have connected ourselves to your eternal purpose that you have for us in Jesus. Lord, we just thank you and we love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on, give Jesus another hand of praise. He's worthy. God bless everybody. Thank you so much. And uh, there will be some folks here to pray with you if you have a personal need in your life that you want to share. Some friends will be here to pray with you. God bless you. Man, have a great week, everyone.